Welcome to the Irregular Podcast. Hi, and welcome to the first uh, Irregular Podcast show in what we hope will become an expanding series of, of podcasts. Um, and talks over a whole host of topics really affecting us gamers today whether it be movies and franchises to uh, the likes of what's happening on on, on the internet politics naturally war games as well um, through to historical discussions what ifs and and more Um, for this uh, introductory session I'm joined by the other co-founder of the Irregular Project uh, Jason Jason how are you doing I'm alright actually yeah um, you know, this is something we've talked about for a long time. Um, we've had the magazine up and running for, for uh, since 2009. And the last couple of years we've talked about podcasting, video, and we're finally biting the bullet and putting out our first episode, which is pretty cool. <laughs> no, def- definitely. I mean, it's, it's gosh, 10 years. It's, it's looking back, it's, it's a very, very long time. Um, I mean, this, you know, I suppose to give an instructor kind of where I am, I'm, uh, you know, a young... Um, almost mid thirties British guy. I've um, been been doing wargaming since since gosh, I suppose really um, entering junior school, which is going to be nineteen ninety three. So maybe being eight or nine, ten years old, maybe. Um, obviously, Jason, you've been into this a lot more than than I have. So <laughs> yeah, just a little bit longer. Um, yeah, I guess I I start I started when I was a kid. I mean, collecting airfix figures. Um, there used to be a shop around the corner from where we lived and it was a traditional hardware sh- shop and they sold everything from wood tools and all that kind of thing. but he had a bucket of a mixed bucket of one three I think it's one three two the yeah, airfix big, big big figures and then okay. he'd have another bucket of the one seven two stuff now I collect the bigger stuff the one the one three two stuff and my brother used to collect the one seven two and it was like I think it was a penny or a two pence for the big ones and a like two for a penny on the little ones so by the fact we're talking pennies we are talking a very 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 long time ago here um, we're talking early 80s <laughs> 1960s whatever <laughs> no um yeah yeah well I, I think that's where everyone starts really i mean you know very much like yourself i kind of had airfix kits as a kid um something my dad was very very fond of when when he was younger building one 132 135 scale um model kits big of that generation as well um you know the world war ii was still a very very big thing you know with spitfires hurricanes um typhoons think things like um escape from colditz which i know i know obviously has seen a, a bit of a, a resurgence recently those are the kind of things that they grew up with and in turn mm. i was kind of partially as was exposed to that as well so yeah and i think my generation i grew up I mean, my brother grew up reading American comics, um, which kind of inspired his um, sort of t- towards get his style of gaming that he did. Uh, and I think he's moved more now into sort of computer games as he's got older. Uh, I grew up reading comics like Warlord and Roy of the Rovers and the Commando, the little Commando. I com- know some of those. I know some of those things like 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 Victor book for boys. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. They, and, they um, sorts of things. Blue Peter albums. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I guess that I really got into gaming. We moved down to, to near Cornwall, near, Laun- near Launceston. And we were in a row of four ha- cottages. And on the end cottage was a lad called Lee. And he was into Dungeons and Dragons. He was just getting into Warhammer because that was coming through. That was quite new. And uh, and he introduced me to that style of gaming. Mm. Uh, and then through my teenage years, it was things like Blood Bowl and Cosmic Encounters. Warhammer, Dungeons and Dragons, that was massive locally. Uh, we also played a game called Bushido, set in feudal Japan I think RPG. I've seen Bushido, yeah, yeah. And then we sort of started playing other RPGs such as um, Middle Earth role playing. But uh, I think the big one was always Warhammer and Blood Bowl. Mm. They were like the two main games that we played. Um, I mean, I, th- I think from a, um, certainly from a, from a, I suppose, a UK school kid. Uh, kid perspective, um, Games Workshop, Warhammer. You know, they 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 were on the high street. They were definitely the, I suppose, the thing of that generation. Um, probably early to mid nineties to, I suppose, all the way up to the the, the Lord of the Rings boom, really. Um, with 
Games Workshop and Warhammer being at the forefront of this sort of stuff. Certainly from 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 my point, I remember seeing um, Warhammer being played by a bunch of guys at school um, who were in the year above me, uh, and I was like, what the, what the what the hell is all this model stuff? You know, these, these little guys. Uh, and I I just think I remember going to one of the lunchtime clubs um, at school. The, the main reason for going to these clubs was to was to get a pass so you could like skip in front of everybody else. All the, all the year 11s that used to be in um, you know, first dibs on, on on lunch and whatnot, and you could get through straight away. And through through joining the chess club, I, I'm not I'm, I'm a geek, but not that much of a geek, but I am a geek. Um, I um, I managed to find out about this whole Warhammer thing, and really from there I remember going to very much like yourself a uh, a model shop and I bought my first box of um, Space Marines, it was the old uh, second edition Warhammer um, 40k um, blue box of tactical marines where you got the uh, you know the 10 metal guys, the old rocket launcher with the chap on, on his shoulder and, and the very very static pose stuff with the um, you know the ultramarine kind of chap with the, with the power fist and the flame in the box and it was I suppose the, the, the beginning of a whole world really that kind of blew my mind um, the very first time you, you kind of play the game to discover like you know when my friend Tim came out it's like what the hell is that Tim it's like it's an anti-grav platform it's got a distortion cannon it's like what the hell is a distortion cannon and an anti-grav platform and who are these Eldar people and Tyranids and yeah it was very much the I suppose the a, a humongous gateway to um, to the world that has basically been with me for the last 20 something years um, mm. and I think it's through through both of our collective interests that we actually managed to find each other at some point. Um, uh, around what, what, 10, 12, maybe 10, 11? Would it be about, would have been about 2008, I think. Yeah, yeah. Early 2008, we first um, met. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, at, at the time I was working in one of the um, the, the local games workshop stores. Uh, and I remember, I remember Jason and, um, uh, and partner dropping in at the time. Um, and literally, you know, kind of, I suppose it was very much a, a first pass introduction to kind of, you know, where you'd come from, what, what you know, what you got involved in. Um, I, I think did we have a painting competition. I think it was a painting competition I think that it you was guys. A, I think it was a painting competition. Um, it might have been for for Harry the Hammer and and what was he? Twenty five years of Warhammer, maybe something like that. Yeah. And I think that painting competition kind of brought brought I suppose you guys into the fold of the the. Um, Becoming, I suppose, um, my store regulars um, when when we're at uh, at workshop, um, and really from there, I suppose this this kind of friendship has has ballooned and exploded into worldwide travels and re- regular gaming and clubs and the whole irregular project, really. Yeah, I mean, because my I predominantly am a historical gamer, and I first got into historicals through playing Avalon Hill games as a teenager, hmm. and then when I joined the military. Um, I really my gaming kind of fell to one side. I, the only time types of games I played were, if I played any, was Napoleonics, which is which is my first intro into historical war games with miniatures. Because mm. up until that point, it'd been Avalon Hill and it it'd been on like a board and yeah. you used like cardboard tokens and stuff. I, I've I've played quite a few of those old ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I when I came out of the services. Uh, I went back into playing fantasy again stuff and that was because I was a student in Plymouth and GW had gotten rid of all their specialist games oh okay and they were being sold in the works ah okay for like 10 quid I got Talisman 3rd edition and all of the uh, expansions for like 30 quid I I, I, I decided to cut a question I I remember this time um, when when a new retail park had opened up near my neck of the woods and they had copies of Space Hulk in an equivalent, I think it was called like Banana Bookshop or something, which I think was originally part of the, the whole kind of works group and, and again, you know, Space Hulk being a I suppose a, 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 you know, an entry point from my perspective as well Yeah so I, I, went, I gained, went back into gaming quite heavily and I, and after the military uh, um, and it was GW again but because and it was only because they were getting rid of the specialist games, and they were in. And that's <laughs> yeah, basically. Right, so, so on a squaddy wage, you could pick, you could you could pick them up. <laughs> yeah. I was a student then. Well, I, sorry, sorry, student wage, you could pick I, them and up. That was, and I, I was um, still doing historical stuff, but only painting. 
I was doing commission painting. Yeah. But it was only English Civil War at that point. Um, because I had some friends near where my mum lived who were English Civil War reenactors and they war gamed it. And I was painting their armies for them. And then I, I was pretty much heavily involved in playing Games Workshop for quite a long time. Mm. Basically, fantasy. I didn't get into 40k until about 2005, 2006. So I was pretty, I'm quite, quite late to the 40k. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose, again, it's down to that whole accessibility thing, isn't it, really, with, with, with Workshop being literally the only kind of high street store we have here, apart from, obviously, independent stockists, of which it's very much, I suppose, even, and I think even still to this day, you have to know where it is or know of it to go and find it. You would yeah. never just come across it. Or if you do, it's incredibly rare. Um, and then it was around that kind of time I sort of picked up Warhammer Ancients. Mm. And then I went full on then into historics. Uh, and then we eventually moved up the Shef- I eventually moved up to Sheffield and I uh, met Alex and I, I got back into doing uh, GW again, Games Workshop stuff. Uh, more 40k this time. I was predominantly for by this point. I was predominantly 40k. You, you have a big stint though in Lord of the Rings. I, I, yeah, I do yeah, remember that quite yeah. a lot. As you, you, you're yeah. one of the the primary um, players of Lord of the Rings within the shop, and, and I remember the conversations at the time of, as, as to why. Because from a from a workshop perspective, we were all about tanks, space marines, and all that kind of stuff. And Lord of the Rings. Perhaps was it by this time? Obviously, it, it had you know gone for the cinema, gone for the DVDs, and we were on the subsequent releases of you know the Dwarven expansion and the and the Mordor expansion and the Khazad expansion and stuff. And I, and I remember you saying that the reason you chose Lord of the Rings specifically was because the the miniatures were, I think, sculpt, a, they were sculpted by the Perry. So straight away we've got we've got a really good historical and proportional kind of sculpt going up with those guys but that because they were more I suppose gritty fantasy um, than what Warhammer fantasy had become which is very much kind of not not the high end fantasy we have today but certainly something yeah something more I in between they were, they were more, I, more real I suppose for you guys for you when you were yeah playing. I prefer a true scale model rather than um, heroic scale uh, and I tended to veer when I was playing fantasy to human armies yeah because they tended even the games workshop ones even the even though they're um, heroic scale humans they're still closer to a true scale than mm. than some of the other races um and, and i've always preferred uh, human armies i mean even as a teenager i've played human armies and i think that's because of my interest in history and even way back when you know first second third edition the human armies tended to look like medieval armies well yeah, it's, it's the whole thing about typical you know the empire kind of next sort of neo medieval german kind of yeah and then, look to them yeah and, and, and in the later editions they look like um the swiss Lang- Langschets. yeah yeah you know they so they look more like historical armies and i think that's what i i i, I sort of mm liked the human armies in the empire and i like the lord of the rings i moved to lord of the rings because um tolkien based a lot of it on historical well it's 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 a i mean um, the rohan are effectively saxons well it's it's, it's vikings of the plains i think yeah. the, they, they they often say on the dvd uh, commentaries i mean um you know I, I think outside of things like king arthur and stuff you know that well, we, we have no real mythology over here. It's not like we have the whole Beowulf thing and stuff like they have, uh, you know, in the um, in the Nordics and whatnot. We, you know, we've we've got the King Arthur. We have the Robin Hood, but it's it's not. There's no real ancient ancient historic kind of stuff that's there. And I think I think this was his attempt to to, to give it a bit of a, uh, a bit of a mythology really in, in his native lands. Yeah, and then the other reason for liking Lord of the Rings was the rule system. Yeah, yeah. At, at the time, I felt both fantasy and 40k had become a bit clunky. I'd, I'd, I'd definitely agree with you there. I think because, I suppose, Lord of the Rings was written... Who's it originally written by? I want, I want to say Alessio. Was it Alessio? Or did he write I, later stuff? I can't remember. I, I think he was one of the main writers of 
of the system. We've we've got the rule book somewhere, so on, on another show we'll we'll we'll, we'll dig those out and, and go into them with more detail. But I think because of the way that it was written as a fresh, taking the best parts of 40k fantasy and adding the the whole might, will, fate um, kind of characteristics to the to the game. You know, in terms of being able to modify dice rolls or kind of add to your numbers and things. That really, I think, made it. Uh, a very very quick unique and, and easy but but good system to represent that the the attributes and the toughness of your characters like your Aragorns and like your Boromir that had like nothing but might and he would smash yeah. his way through through uh, you know armies of opposing Urukai or orcs and I think one of the other reasons was I was at that, that point slowly moving towards skirmish based games well that, that's a massive thing skirmish isn't it Be- in itself because I was then I kind of stopped playing fantasy mass battles and I was heavily into like more time yeah uh, I absolutely loved more time is I well, yeah well, yeah I mean there's definitely there's definitely time next, showing more time yeah, for us to, for next to, to Lord of the somewhere. Rings more time I personally think per my personal thing is one of the best games I've ever produced mm. I mean say from a fluff perspective it, it, it was it was really nice and the range and the depth of miniatures that were originally produced. I mean, there's there's something bonkers like hundred and something plus miniatures. Let alone all the the cool you know creature in the wood, the um, the the stagecoach, the the um, uh, carnival of chaos stuff. But it, it was the it was the terrain they got with in the box. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it it was card it was card terrain with plastic, <laughs> but it was still really nice terrain. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, the I think that's one of the big appeals when. And again, you know, from over the years, I've bought all kinds of wacky stuff, and and Mordheim is certainly in there. But I think the quality of the terrain and how easy you could achieve the effects of that whole burned out kind of ruined city. Yeah. Um, the, the the idea of, of the you know the the, the meteor appearing like uh, you know oh this let's, let's all rejoice for this amazing star in the sky and Sigmar you know favoring us and then it's a freaking meteorite that like destroys the entire <laughs> city as it's full of corruption and chaos and incest and all kinds of that sort of stuff. Um, but no, I, th- I think definitely in terms of background, it, it was really. It was a it was a game and a concept ahead of its time. Certainly from the the town crier stuff you used to get in White Dwarf, yeah. and, and yeah. you know I suppose where you look to games nowadays, things like the Frostgraves and and how you have all the um, the foreground scenery, it's, it's all gone that kind of way. So I think definitely the 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 whole um, Mordheim was was something certainly before its time and probably didn't get the 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 exposure to, to really grow like it like it could have done which you know personally I really hope that it's on Games Workshop's list of games to to revisit definitely and then it was around this time I think when we were because we, we were all starting to sort of venture out into different sort of games and well yeah outside I mean, of the Games Workshop bubble I, I, think, I think around that time there was a lot of a lot of other stuff that started appearing and, and I remember um, again I'm fortunate in the city that we're in to have um, several independent stockists and I remember rocking up one day and seeing this uh, uncharted seas and thinking mm. oh this is like like man of war but I've, I've never heard of this Spartan games who who the heck are they you know unbeknownst mm. that these guys would would grow to become one of the the more larger of the smaller studios um, within the kind of um, Global war games industry, um, and you know, you know, the warmer hordes and and you know, Spartan games and Mantic appearing well, on well, the scene. Well, Man- Mantic, well, round about that, we was because when we were at this time, we were discussing the fact that back in my when I were a teenager, there were more magazines around. Well, you, you, but we're jumping, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, you, but, but it was around this there. time that Mantic brought out their first miniatures, which were the elves. Well, let's 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 take a little step back a bit. So, when when we when I was at workshop, the big thing that came out was Apocalypse. Yeah. And Ronnie Renton was involved in the whole Apocalypse thing and, and you know doing big battles and stuff like that. Then he obviously he's he's left. At which point, when we were in the store together, we were discussing the, the you know the finer days of of older white dwarfs almost looking back with a with a real sense of nostalgia and and maybe maybe kind of glazed over eyes and 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 whatnot of, of the older white dwarfs i mean personally 
my first white dwarf was issue 223 and I will always remember it because it was the issue with the metal legion of the damned that came out um, and, and I bought it on when I was on holiday and it was like I must have read it back to front seven or eight times it was the best thing ever mine had just dread on the cover <laughs> <laughs> I well, can't even your, remember your, yours is really old. I, I, I can't even remember what number it is but it had just gosh. dread on the cover I've, I've got I've got all the PDFs somewhere um, of, of most of the old white dwarfs and things where it's got to be what one oh, maybe maybe 80 90 ish yeah I think like it's, that. I think it's under number 100 it, yeah yeah it probably is because I'm, I'm sure by 100 ah. they've reached that older white dwarf standard we, we, we remember rather than the the neo cyberpunk wacky kind of I, I think by 100 it, it started moving into being um a citadel one rather yeah. than games yeah so, so that yeah. it was more sort of like warhammer 40k and blah 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 yeah um whereas before it was pretty much anything went mm they used to have RPG articles. Oh no, there, there was there was loads of crazy stuff in there. You know everything from you know D and D expansions to um, they had um, Thrud the Barbarian as a comic. I remember I remember that being in there. There was Call of Cthulhu stuff, all, all kinds of crazy stuff from those older White Dwarves. But uh, again, I, I suppose from our perspective, that the at the time the the quality in I suppose of the hobbiness and the hobby articles within the magazine had really taken a nosedive for I suppose what we as I would say experienced gamers and the hobbyists w were expecting and were almost ready to demand um, of of those white dwarfs that were coming out at the time and you know we sat down one day and said well why the hell don't we you know create our own really um, and I suppose from that point which is again way back probably towards the summer of maybe even the autumn of, of 2008 um, that we started the idea of rolling this into a bit of a you know let's look at the old stuff what we liked what what was really good about it and um, the types of articles you know Taylor for gamers some of the some of the hand-built terrain that uh, I want to say I want to say Nick Davis used to produce and um, some of the wacky conversions that came out of Adrian Wood and his his bonkers orcs and things to the likes of Fat Bloke and others that you know Paul Sawyer that were that were churning out really cool stuff back in the day um, and wanting to get to a point of being able to replicate all that greatness in our own way yeah and I think one of the other things was that I grew up when I grew up there was there was you had the white dwarf you, know, you had other book, uh, magazines but they covered more uh, manufacturers game manufacturers than just one hmm. um, and, I, and we were, at the time when we were just talking about this I think the main magazines on the market was White Dwarf well I don't remember any others I mean, uh, and the Privateer Press one ah yeah maybe maybe, maybe, maybe BP yeah yeah um, apart from that at the time unless you were into historicals because I think they were historic there was uh, there's obviously the military modeling magazines but they kind of came to, towards more uh, 135 scales on a bar yeah yeah, yeah 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 you definitely rather than your war game scales yeah um i think there were probably war historical war game magazines but they but for a general sort of sci-fi fantasy mix there, there was, there was wasn't. nothing really else no no and, I, I, and like i said i grew up where there was and you had fanzines where you know people made their own mm mm and I wrote for some of those um, back when I was a teenager and when I came out of the services and got back into gaming in a big way though those were kind of like a that's kind of where you went um, for, for your uh, magazines and uh, uh, sort of fanzine route and stuff like that mm. if you mm. wanted to get into writing for gaming and stuff like that um, and that was one of the things I kind of wanted to replicate well I mean you you'd you'd come from doing publishing all the bits and bobs hadn't you as well yeah so I mean I, I had a me I, I left the military and went and uh, went back to university and studied media yeah uh, and had a background in media um, so Jack it, Jack of all trades master of none I call myself <laughs> but I mean, in, in having that kind of skill set I mean I, I I was fortunate to come out of of school with fair decent grades and, and I'd been keeping up with with other stuff as well so I suppose really it, it gave us a, a quite a good foundation um, and, and by this time we'd I suppose we'd on top of the 
the magazine we'd also tried to get a some so a project up and running that would cover multiple areas, particularly yeah. particularly painting as well. Yeah. Um, which and again, we were very very fortunate at the time of where the the veterans and things were within within the local games workshop store that they were there were a good twenty or thirty of us I think originally that that were involved in in really kind of being that first batch of of what would, what would come to be known as regulars. Um, because we we were all shapes and sizes, all different ages and different. Yeah, groups. because it didn't become, it didn't become a magazine at first. It became a painting group. Yes, yeah, definitely a, a painting club, which was called Sheffield Regulars. Yeah, and the 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 main goal of the of the club at the time was was to enable um, a lot of the young guys that were coming in that that were, I suppose, taught the school of painting of you know, get paint on it, stick it on there, stick it on the table, and away you go. And we were very, very fortunate to have a lot of, I would say, more professional painters that were involved in the likes of um, The Basement and uh, Platoon Britannica, which were quite big, big things way back in the day, back in back in um, 28, 28, 2008, 2009, where um, these guys were producing a lot of their the kind of trophy winning pieces, a lot of yeah, the shows, yeah. um, you know, whether it was Derby Warlords to the likes of Salute and, and others. Yeah, I mean... They were big on pushing towards like winning, trying to win golden demons uh, and stuff like that. And they were painting at a, a vastly higher level than what we were. Yeah. But what Sheffield Regulars allowed us to do was to actually meet those guys and actually learn from them. Yeah, definitely. And I, I remember there were there were a lot of um, a lot of really really good sessions that came out of that. Whether it was the likes of, you know, you know. L- the the school of workshop painting that I'd I'd certainly been taught was very much you know whack paint on it and away you go and if you want to pink you pick a pink off the shelf, whereas these guys were very much about like well if you want to pink I mix like you know a bit of red a bit of yellow and a bit of white, which was from from my concept a completely alien concept you know um, Robin and you know absolutely fantastic guy a very very good painter he had about twenty paints to his name but the guy could churn out you know shade after shade after shade of different colours and things and the you know the color theory behind it his approach to painting it was it's just a completely alien to how i've been taught well yeah, they took more they they um took model painting to that step of where it's more like art yes and they're using techniques that would be that uh guys that studied art and built or an artist would use on a 3d free three, three-dimensional model yeah 3d canvas basically yeah yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of those some of those guys went on to um Go and paint in heavy metal. Mm. Like David Hayfield. Yes. He went and spent time um, as a member of the heavy metal team. Um, and they've they've gone on to win demons and well, salutes. Well, people like Robin, Adrian yeah. Bay. You know, you've got you've got uh, John Harrison and things. And there's a lot, a lot of those kind of guys that were very very, um, you know, very very kind of big and winning the the bronzes, the silver, the golds in demons were in, were involved in helping kind of shape that initial. Um, painting group that we had and we were very very fortunate on top of that um to also be supported by by patriot games and by jim and by yeah. um uh, the guys down there when um you know rackham as a as a as a company and what, what was their game called Wackham's game confrontation. confrontation that's the one confrontation was very very big and the quality of the miniatures that rackham were putting out were very much ebbing away i suppose at the the standard stuff that we were playing from a GW perspective, and certainly, you know, as as any of us gamers will know, we love new and shiny. So a lot of us kind of really switched our our kind of you know long gone were army painting or, or half painting armies or undercoating armies and just gaming to really you know trying to pick a model, a small unit, and really kind of push push the painting further and further. And you know, we, we had, I think we had great success doing that with with you know several sort of small mini painting competitions within. That um, I think didn't uh, didn't Jim get like a sword for us, like our own mini Slayer sword, at some yeah. point, like a little a little little, little um, sort of I think it was a Chinese sword. It was, yeah, it was. It was a. Um, it's the type. It's the it's a style that used in Tai Chi. Yeah. Um, but that, that that became like a little a little irregulars. Um, so, but we certainly had things like you know we'd have like you know limited palette painting competitions. We would have um, you know non-metallic sessions. And then there was do. the monthly competitions. Yeah, yeah, the, well, which was all run on the, uh, Facebook. Facebook at the, yeah, 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 Facebook the, at the time. Yeah, definitely. On, on the group page, um, 
and that kind of pushed us towards uh, maybe because we started running a blog at one point mm. and um, and I think that led then to the magazine yeah it, it's almost like we, we, we'd had all the pieces together in terms of you know the, the painting stuff in terms of uh, you know regular input from people and, and articles you know like or, or even the concept of articles like um, you know that, that lava base is fantastic how did you paint that um, to the likes of you know some of the um, you know competition would have like oh I'm going to paint this tank with just washers mm. um, and, and really kind of from, from those points yeah I suppose all the pieces came together and allowed us to do a a first stab at our our version of, um, of, of a magazine or of a concept that I suppose it was almost like kind of you know um, written by gamers for gamers kind of thing yeah and, and to be honest I never thought we'd get more than Two or three issues. Yeah, into well, it. yeah. Right, yeah. Like that first issue we put out, I thought, well, if we get, if we if we at best get two hundred downloads, I'll be quite happy. I I I don't know. I I I, I mean, that I was always happy. I, I was always looking forward to it, to it becoming maybe something bigger than that. But I guess I'd never really had any aspirations beyond it growing. But to see that first issue we made though, with with the amount of people that helped contribute towards it, it felt really good. And, and even to this day, it's and you know. Incom- you, but when you, if you compare it to what it is now, it, it's, it was, oh, it's it was, it was quite evolved. That, yeah, our yeah. first issue was quite ropey. But that first weekend, we, we went we went to live on the internet. It got something like eighteen hundred downloads. That's nice. and I was absolutely flabbergasted that it got that much. And I think after by second issue, it had six thousand downloads over the Jeez. period of. Three but, months. I mean, this this was at a time though when when the whole kind of e-zine, e-magazine kind of PDF thing was just taking off. Because I know that I think we tried it, and I know a few other guys were trying to do. Different yeah, stuff there at was. The time. I I think by the time we got issue three out, there was a lot more of them. There were a lot more people putting mm. out magazines. A lot of them were heavily focused on a particular game or genre of game. Yeah, because um, there was quite a few that were specifically related to particular armies in Warhammer Fantasy, mm. uh, and, uh, and then there was, there was a sort of a load that sprang up out of nowhere, looking at retro um, role play gaming, yeah, like yeah. the retro D and D gaming, a D and D and stuff like that, and it just kind of like at that point just. St- Steamrolled. It, it did. The, I mean, the I mean, magaz- I mean certainly at this time, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly invite the reader, uh, sorry, the reader, the listener, even, to go back uh, and and look at the website. So you know, www.irregular-magazine.com, and just I suppose really go back and look at some of those older issues. Certainly, they've they've come a long way um, in in terms of the quality and stuff. But as 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 Jason rightly puts it, it was a it was a very very exciting first time to. To really kind of put this stuff there, and and there were a lot of really cool ideas in it. I mean, I I will always look back and and love my little blast from the past with Hero Quest, which I I still regard as one of the greatest games um, of of all time, really, in terms of its you know complexity yet simplicity uh, that anyone could really go and and as one of those entry point games, um, you know, it'll always have a soft spot in my heart. But certainly, I think from 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 kind of where we were, it, it kind of went up and up and up really. Because well, I think one of the things we were fortunate that when we set it up, a lot of the big companies that now exist were just starting to get off the ground. Mm. Mantic, Warlord, yeah, yeah, yeah. A- and we got a lot of assistance from those guys in in terms of reviews and stuff like that. And in fact, War Warlord were uh, amazing because um, I started. We started attending shows. Yeah. And I started doing a dip because I got into using the dip, army painted dip. dip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and at the, at the time, I, I think it was Paul came, Paul so he came over to me uh, and said, if you will, you know, do the demos, yeah. we'll supply you with loads of miniatures. And I, we went to I think it was a show with which one of their shows. Mm. They were demonstrating. Yeah, where. where it was, um, I, I want to say Manchester or Leeds Way or something, I, or, or was it Derby? Or? No, I think it was at Maelstrom. In was it Maelstrom? Well, I mean, well, I mean, I suppose, I suppose for 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 for, for the listener, this just shows kind of how how intense it really was. Once we we kind of 
started the ball rolling we were at shows all over the place where they yeah. were you know, presenting as both the irregular painting group and as irregular magazine, magazine. Um, and from there you know people people would start rocking up to you and things and would, and would recognize the, the magazine and and it was oh you know we, we, this is this is quite quite unusual this I'm, I'm I'm getting recognized for for what we're doing and things and and really kind of a lot of a lot of opportunities kind of came forth from that to you know as, as Jay said you know work with the guys at Warlord and things and and you know demo some of their products to um, being offered you know lots of miniatures and things that, that, we, that we could use for running painting sessions and stuff and and I, I specifically remember attending a lot of the shows like um, like triples and things that used to be in Sheffield um, and using a lot of these miniatures to teach you know the, the 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 dads and whoever that were coming along to these shows and and that would that were bringing the kids with them to start learning how to paint you know where, where they could they could chuck around a crazy planet of the apes monkey or or, or whatever it was to to get painted yeah and it's just it, it was a very interesting time when we first started because i think another pair of group that set themselves up around the same time i don't know uh, the I, biggest, I, I, I know i know where you're going to go with this the biggest on, on, go they, they, this. they are the biggest online yeah. um, gaming community well gaming community media thing it was beasts yeah beasts started around the same time now 2009 mm -hmm. um and, and they've just Grown. Well, they they they, they are just they are the off. they are the pinnacle. They are the top. They are they are the you could say the 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 GW the fantasy flights of of, of I suppose this whole kind of mm. thing. Um, I mean, again, we've been fortunate over time to work with um, you know and Warren and, and the guys at Beast and do do a bunch of different stuff. Um, you know, and had lots of conversations about about kind of how how the industry has changed and how how. I suppose the, the the consumption of news and media has also changed. Yeah. Whether it's the the magazine to the website to to blogs to to podcasts, um, and more. So yeah, it's it's been a very very kind of uh, you know a really really interesting time and a very very big learning curve from our perspective. Um, you know, certainly, I mean, as as far as the the project went, you know, it's it's had its ups and downs, and and you know that's that's to be expected considering that you know of 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 the changes that have happened in both our lives over the last sort of 10 yeah, 15 and, years and, and guys of people that have worked with with the mag on the magazine and with the magazine have come and gone for various different reasons um some of them is because of work changes and stuff like that or they've moved away um versus a big pair big one of the big people that was involved in the earlier um part of the magazine was a guy called dave barker mm. and he's he's still responsible for our web um, but he, used to, he was um, heavily involved in the magazine at the start. But because of having to move for, for work reasons down to Cambridge, is now basically does is only, is only his main role now is just is keeping the web alive yeah. for us. Well, he's, he's, he's never here. He's always in, in India yeah. and, and, and <laughs> you know you ever see you know where, where's Dave on you know and on Facebook is there with his like you know in Gatwick Airport jetting off to India to do this consulting or jetting off here to do that consulting. So no, I mean it's it's. I suppose to a certain extent it's been very much like like leaving school you know there was an original group of us all you know the, the, the 20 or 30 guys uh, and girls and um, girls that we had in there as well and then as time has gone on you know as, as, as Jason said you know people have have dripped off have moved away you know the guys that were studying in Sheffield at university have gone back home you know people have, have, have moved away kind of you know some have come back some haven't um, but I suppose it's it's very core. It's always been kind of you know sort of you and I sort of waving the the, the yeah, flag to yeah. a certain extent. And, uh, we've had like core we've had core writers on board for um, for time, and you know there's people from in America and, and Canada that used to write for us on a regular basis. Mm. But they're now off doing their own projects. Yeah. So they're no longer writing for us. Which is which is a shame, but it's quite good that they've gone off and done their own stuff. Oh no, definitely. I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that you know kind of ev everyone everyone got something whether it was experience exposure um you know to from from the irregular product at the time and and i suppose really 10 years on from that from, from that initial magazine you know i mean i i'm i'm certainly in a different position with regards you know my, my life and my professional career um and how all consuming it tends to be of, uh, of most hours in the day you're certainly in a, in a in a kind of different position but kind of here we are um and I suppose really that kind of brings us onto the, onto the podcast side of the story, which is kind of how, you know, of of all the times that we are able to get together still, which we do try at our at our local gaming centre, Castle Gaming, 
um, run by a, a friend of ours, Jonathan's, which again is another one of those nice things to come out of the magazine yeah, and our friendship. We, is, we met Jonathan roughly about the same time we set the magazine yeah, up. It, it was, yeah, yeah. And, and he's he's kind of over the years of, of you know us knowing Jonathan, he's gradually managed to you know change kind of his 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 approach to um, self-employment and things and now and now he owns a gaming store with hopefully a uh, a, a, a new a new GW account in there so yeah. it's almost like it's come full circle really John came to workshop and now he's selling the workshop stuff yeah because we when we first met him he was a commission painter yeah. and for as long as we've known him he's always been banging on about owning his own shop yes, yes and then last year he finally got around to actually setting up his own shop no definitely which is and now in the Stockbridge High Street for anyone wants to uh, know where it is Definitely, and it's it's nice to kind of it's, it's almost like the, I suppose in 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 kind of certainly my eyes and, and probably yours it's it's all because of this original stuff we did way back in you know two thousand and eight that's kind of you know yielded the friendships and the experience and and the exposure and I think you know us us three us four you know guys are, are still are still really close you know when we bump into Dave at shows when he when he's working on the. Um, Hassle free miniature stand and things. Always see him walking around with another carrier bag <laughs> full of uh, full of full of full of miniatures. It's like, where is that going to go, Dave? Because you've got no space to put it. Because under the stairs, in the garage, in the attic, you know, in the cupboards, in the living. We room. have to point out that Dave, I've I've been in gaming on and off now for over for about over twenty years. I have never met anyone with such a collection <laughs> as Dave Barker. It's. It's it, it it must be an, an a friggin Guinness record or something. Yeah, it, it must be. The amount of stuff the guy's got is just bonkers. And the and the best bit is though, he paints most yeah, of it. Yeah. <laughs> as, as, you know, as someone that you know can can afford to to buy you know the, the latest GW stuff and things, and it sits on on the sprue or in a plastic box and does nothing. Dave will buy it, paint it, and he's got millions and millions of painted miniatures. I'm I'm, I'm jealous. And he, and he, how many kids has Dave got again? Is it like two, 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 two girls? So and you know he's. Two, two girls, wife, job, jet setting, and he still manages to paint this stuff. I'm, I'm incredibly, you know, like, God, I think, what is it? First time I painted five tanks in about six months recently. It's uh, it's disgusting. I, I, I remember helping him box up his stuff. This before he moved? Well, before he moved. Yeah. And I was just absolutely flabbergasted with how much stuff he had. And, and, you, and it was a huge amount of unpainted stuff. Uh, and you think, well, it's just like anyone's grey. Everyone's got a grey on me. This bit, no, and he doesn't paint anything. And then we had to go and get his boxes of painting stuff, yeah. and it just kept coming and coming and coming. And this is this is a man that could own his own sh- superstore of just his own collection. Almost like, almost like a, a Warhammer world worth yeah. of uh, worth of stuff. Uh, no, he's. He, he's an absolute legend. He's he absolute is, legend. and his knowledge on gaming is immense. Yeah. It is, I, I, I have never met anyone with such a deep breadth of knowledge on gaming. Was, wasn't wasn't both he, him, you and him involved in shaping a lot of the uh, English Civil War stuff? Um, or, or, or sorry, a very British Civil War, wasn't very, it? Which yeah, was the, um, the, the 1920s kind of... He he was involved in, in playing it. Mm. Or oh, playtesting um, it and stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I wrote the stuff for Cornwall and I wrote the stuff, the um, original stuff, I think it was for Singapore mm. um, in the early, but um, when the when that game first came out onto the scene. Um, so I, I developed the stuff for, which was, Cornwall, which was renamed as Kerno, which was the, yeah, Cor- yeah. which is the Celtic name for Cornwall. And then when they did the Empire in Flame, I think it was Empire in Flame, something like that it was called, the book, but it was the, it was looking at the British Empire um, oh, with yeah. Stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I wrote this stuff for I think it was Singapore and Malaysia. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was quite that was quite and that that was quite an interesting experience, and that that was off the back of the magazine. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I guess all things considered, you know, the 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 whole irregular project, the magazine, it, it's it's yielded so much, and I think from my perspective, it's the it's, it's the continued friendship with you guys. I mean, I'm so fortunate to to of being able to keep in touch with you, you know, when when you've you've moved halfway down the country, and we've still managed to get together and things, and and you know we've 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 caught up to the likes of um, Jonathan going AWOL for for a number of number of years, disappearing into a cave on Mars, maybe for all we know, and then finding him again, um, and obviously you know be, being being involved in 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 the store and things, and and 
you know, just picking up all the pieces, I suppose, really, of, of, of where we were. And again, there, there are there are so many stories looking back. Everything from you know that first uh, that first call of Cthulhu session at the Mask of Narathota, but and I can see you smiling. The uh, the Mask of Narathota, but the uh, at the Polish club, um, that first time we did it, and you know, crazy young me not really getting role playing and throwing dynamite everywhere, to um, to to you know all the all the adventures we've had going to the likes of Salute and and the Expo yeah, over the and, years, and, and you know the the, well, the, was that, the, the drinking I, games, and, and I think it, one of the was it like. Not last painting session, the painting session before we were talking about going to shows. Yes, yes. And then um, we were we were going over as as a regulars um, and a regular magazine to a show. I think it was um, in Cheshire somewhere. And Jonathan spilled super glue. That's right. Yes, all it, down it, his it, arm. It, yeah, no, it was not like no, he'd he'd, um, he'd got one of those massive like industrial pots of super glue in his bag, and it had, when we were travelling, it it knocked it over, and it had all spilt in his bag, and he dipped his hand straight into the bottom of it. And he must have spent the last six hours peeling super glue off his. It was he looked like disgusting. He <laughs> <laughs> looked like invasion, the body snatchers, or, or some sort of psoriasis or something <laughs> as well. But, it, it, but again, it's there. Are, there are there are so many great memories we've got, and and you know, again, we're, we're so fortunate now to be able to have, um, you know, Jonathan's place, the, the the Castle Gaming, to be able to go, and and chill out together and things. And and again, you know, as you say, when when we're together, it's it's really nice. Uh, you know, talking about those those older days of, of the adventures we had, but also making making new adventures. I mean, we we were we were talking. Um, we had we had the the PC on and stuff, and something came up about the golf, and you know, all all the kind of stories that that came well, out about your time in the golf. And, yeah, and because also um, it wasn't just me there talking about well, given no, their war no. stories, there was. A, well, yeah, I mean, we've we've got uh, Morton, who's one of the the other guys that kind of works at uh, at, at the company I work at. He's um, I forget what he said he was now. He's like a machine gunner or something. Yeah, or, he's, he's um, ex Danish Army. That's the one, ex Danish Army. We, we used Infantry. to have. Infantry. You know, Robin again, that that um, that expert painter. He he was an ex paro and he had some fantastic stories um, about being on exercise and things. There's 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 kind of your your war stories from the uh, from the Gulf, and it, it's been you know a, a really amazing experience to have. I suppose at the core of everything, the irregular project pulling us all together, but fundamentally that love of plastic toy soldiers. Whether you whether you come into it from you know the the airfix and the and, and the Ravel modelling side, or it's the you know initial getting into it from from Games Workshop with those first bunch of Space Marines to the likes of Hero Quest and, and, and more. But gaming's changed since we started up the project. Oh yeah, completely. Yeah, Get, yeah. In that time, that that. Ten year span, because mm. now ten years, it, the gaming change, gaming scene's changed quite a lot. I mean, if you go down to Jonathan's um, Castle Gaming on Wednesday night, it's all board game. Yeah, well, I, I suppose that's that's a, that's a really a really good point to kind of. And some of those guys have always been dedicated board gamers, but there's a quite a good bunch of them down there that have, were five years ago would have played nothing but war games, mm, mm. and um, and they're down there playing. Um, board games on a Wednesday night, and it's and I, 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 it's, it's a very very good point you made there because there's there's a big, you know, when when we look back and there was that kind of boom and explosion in in it's almost, it's almost like you can track it through so from 2008 to say um, probably kind of like 20, 20 2013 2014 that was the time of the war gaming of, of all the, of all these other companies appearing you know the the you know the Spartan games, the Mantics, the, the the tour gaming, all those kind of guys that, you know, people were like, you know, I'm, I'm going to give this a go. You know, my my miniature gaming company, and a lot of those kind of smaller independent studios were were producing some really really good stuff. Then Kickstarter comes out of frigging nowhere, yeah. And before you know it, overnight, the the miniature gaming scene, I suppose, for most independent studios, seems to have massively gone down, and it's been replaced by all these guys in their garages. Producing the likes of you know you've got um, the, the the drop zone commander guy and Dave and you know he he produced that from his garage. You've got all these amazing board games that are coming well, out. Companies like Monolith and and you know um, the uh, Kingdom Death. You know huge huge companies that are coming well, so out. Studio McVeigh. Yeah, exactly. I mean th those guys came back from the states, having like, working for Privateer Press to set up their own company, and it would have been about two thousand. Nine, two thousand ten, around that era, mm. and they started off by doing boutique models, and now they're involved in 
board game production. Yeah, yeah. It's, I it's mean, a, they had their own tradition wars. It's amazing how they've, they've kind of they're it, kind of like producing boutique scale miniatures for board games. I mean, I, mean, I remember when when McVeigh was doing flats, and and Aaron was looking to buy some, wasn't he, from yeah. um, from from one of the trade shows and things, through to. Um, the, again, where they are now and, and producing board games, it, it's definitely it's really, really, really changed. And you know, there's been a huge. Exp- I think, and again, I, th- I think through Kickstarter has probably been the biggest thing to affect but this industry I, the last, I, in the last ten years. I think one of the reasons is because now um, plastic production has moved to a, to, a, to a point where I'm glad you've said that because I know where you're going um, with this now. The gaming pieces. I look really really nice and they're really good quality sculpts that that attracts the miniature war game players into the war games yeah and and to make that whole thing possible it's china basically yeah. it's that whole you know china manufacturing thing you know it, it started with you know the likes of workshop looking at this you know way back during the um, the sort of lord of the rings times and opening up their first production facility there in china you know obviously you've got you know the likes of bandai that, that are over there you know japan and malaysia producing the gundam kits and that whole i suppose generation of technology and, and tooling and machining to, to people rightly you know creating something amazing on kickstarter with with prototypes that were 3d printed or or sculpted first time round to then entire industries and factories and probably entire regions and small small towns and, and cities in, in the likes of China just producing millions of board game pieces and stuff because now. Because when we first started Irregular it was predominantly war gaming that we covered. Yes. And we covered role play stuff. Um, we didn't really cover much in the way of board games no. to begin with. Um, and it was still predominantly mass battle games as well at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, uh, apocalypse, and you know yeah. that 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 was where it was at. You know, I mean, big armies, big even, games, even get his, all your miniatures out. Even the historical the War, Warhammer Ancients, yeah, Water, Warhammer, like Waterloo it, yeah, games. it was still big games. And during that ten year period, what with the changes we've seen is that board game, we cover more board games now, mm-hmm. and we predominantly cover cover skirmish gaming. Well, I mean, gosh, it, I suppose that there's so much in here, and we we could probably go on for 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 hours and hours about you know. The, the the advent of the skirmish game coming back with the likes of you know the war machine and hordes to the way that it's influenced the likes of Frostgrave um, and 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 other other stuff that's that's come out there even even the likes of Fantasy Flight who were never known for doing miniatures that have had phenomenal releases with the likes of of, of X Wing to Imperial Assault and um, oh, what's the, what's the what's the one they did they, they um, dabbled in that was it Room Wars that's the one Room Wars thank um, you yeah yeah this which is I think they've now binned um, but they've got Star Wars Legion. Well, it's, it's dust. I mean, that, that's another one that that, uh, that started at FFU. There's been so much in 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 that area that's evolved and changed. The role playing sector has gone through a complete renaissance. You know, role playing was this really kind of boring, dull thing, and now with the likes of Critical Role and all the other shows that are out there, board game sorry, role playing has become a a, a huge industry again. I, I would argue, Toss, it's probably one of the, one of the more bigger industries within within the. Um, Within the gaming sector now, and again, you know, the likes of of, of, of Monolith and uh, and so Modifius even, um, and you know the, the kind of the, the the refocus they've done on things. It's it's been crazy. You only have to look up companies like Pathfinder. Yeah, well, yeah, Pathfinder. The um, way the D and D was redone. I mean, what we want fourth, fourth or fifth now for D and D? Fifth edition D and D. You know, and and uh, you know, we, which has gone more back to its roots. Mm. From I've not played fifth edition D and D yet, but from what people have said to me, it's more. Of, of of my age, yeah. say it's more like the roots of like it, what it used to be like, or it's more about the role play side rather than the rolling dice, the, ma- the magic in the kit, which but, is kind of where it gone. But even again, touching on the Kickstarter, you know, and 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 Jim and Patriot Games, and and there, the fact that you know from the players that are in house at that at that indie, they've they've managed to successfully create an entire universe um, in in their Sins RPG. Took it to Kickstarter, and it's now it's freaking huge. So you think to yourself, like, you know, th- there has been a real sense of empowerment. I think to I, to us I, gamers, I think we've we've seen from the from when we started regular magazine, we've seen the industry explode. Yeah, um, it's going from being one this one behemoth that pretty one, much yeah one, one size fits all kind of you know gigantic behemoth as you say to 
you know such variety and, and, and breadth and scope that you know literally there is a there is a product in a game whether you want you know just cards or cards and miniatures or just miniatures or the role playing and not even having any miniatures to you know the board game version of a particular battle in some fluff for a universe that never existed 10 years ago and it's not just a sci-fi fantasy that's kind of exploded and got a bit of renaissance <coughs> excuse me historicals have oh yeah well i mean all you've got to do is, is look at look at the likes of warlord and what and what they've turned yeah. out i mean bolt action um well i mean that that all started and again there's, a, there's another massive conversation in this about what when when kind of warhammer ancients became warhammer historical became Warhammer historical forge world that didn't quite happen, but then out of the blue, you know, the the the, the bolt action people, of black powder rule set come yeah, along, and and then the Perry they, miniatures, and they exploded yeah. with the help of the fact that a lot of people got fed up with 40k mm. and left 40k and kind of like jumped into bolt action. It had tanks. Well, even, even and, that, I mean, you know, you know and it appealed at, to 40k players. And I love I love how a lot of the the actual and again to go full circle, the original miniature um, model mani miniature manufacturers like Italieri and things like that have come on board with the board game yeah. thing. Um, and all you have to do is look at you know the likes of Warlord and and the things that they're putting out in conjunction with Italieri and stuff and how they're the the kind of um, the the one f f what's what was it was it historic it's like one forty two one fifty something one fifty six like one fifty six thank you that that entire scale did not exist in um, you know miniatures and model making years ago it was always one thirty five or one thirty two one seventy two one forty four um, you know or, or, or one to one forty four it never existed and now with the focus on wargaming and twenty eight millimeter becoming that that optimum size, they they pushed loads of money yeah, into it. Yeah, and the top. I think you had like you had companies like Rubicon. That yeah, specialize prime, prime in, example. Yeah, prime specialize example. in producing model kits for war gamers. Yeah, for bolt action, or oh, well, World War Two gaming in general at that mm. scale. But again, I mean, you know, tech, just, just again to, to 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 touch on the point that we've already made, you know, all you do is take you can take World War Two, and you've got skirmish games. In multiple scales, you've got large battles in multiple scales. You've got you know companies producing the high-end model kits for it. You can you can do this. There's there's so many you know and you yeah, know I mean, the, the whole the whole battlefront to, and flames yeah, of war is a massive yeah, thing to, so, so I, I to talk to about. Say, you only have to look at two companies, Bolt Action, Warlord and Bolt Action, and Battlefront and Flames, flames of, of war, war. Yeah, and see how popular those two games are, uh, and you can see that historicals have suddenly got this renaissance that. It's no mm. longer thought of as being played by. It's not that super niche, that niche yeah, within a niche kind of thing. Grumpy old yeah. men yeah. that want it all painted exactly the way it was originally in the correct colours and all the rest of it. Yeah. Which is what historicals have kind of become. It was this sort of closed sort of niche. Yeah. You, I, you had to have the correct colour schemes and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, certainly being a younger guy going into shows like, you know, The Joy of Six and. and and triples and things it literally was you know kind of old men sitting in their little clique you know they're playing their game of, of you know war the roses or napoleonics with the correct units and the correct flags yeah. and, uh, and you know, now, the correct way and or american civil war yeah, another yeah. example yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah but now you've got games like gangs of rain and mm. mm. um, blood and plunder and um, you've got the new one coming out from war banner that's the, the ancient greeks i think mortal gods or something like that it's called yeah set in the war in Greek states but they're, they're, they're kind of like skirmish games and it's they're, they're more appealing well I, I think I think and you know you're, you're, you're coming to an interesting point there is that you know those games the cost of entry is so much more or less yeah. and I think because there's so much choice now it's it's easier to you know to put that fifty pound into that starter set well, and that little well, game to play it and a thirty pound for a board but game. But you here. just said the right thing, starter set. Yeah. When yeah. I when I was younger, to try and get into historicals was really difficult because there weren't mm. the, you know, these they were cottage industries mm. making the miniatures. There weren't companies making starter sets and then you, you picked up like a rule set like DBA or something like that. It was quite difficult to get into for as a newbie. Yeah. Unless you knew people that were, there, it wasn't like a you pick up a box and you had like two small. It's a star drama, yeah. Yeah, into it, in it, like 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 
GW is doing with fantasy and science fiction. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, glad, glad you touched on the GW bit because if there's anybody that's really perfected the art of of the starter set and is churning out tons of starter sets of all different shapes and sizes and price points, it's definitely GW. Whether it's one of those, um, you know, twenty pound first strike boxes to the blooming, um, you know, um, Warhammer Conquest magazine that they do, where you're literally paying one ninety nine for your first bunch of, of three Primaris Marines. To the likes of, you know, Drop Zone Commander and Drop Fleet Commander, their starter boxes that came out from Hawk to but the new Carnival one. I think things. the industry it helped. What helped that industry was that a lot of guys around the, the sort of like 2007 to 2010 left GW to set up their own companies. Yeah, well, that, that, that's that's and the they big used thing, that right? model mm. going forward with their with their um, games and systems that they were creating. Like Mantic and Warlord and that they produced they were doing start they were doing starter sets for this stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, it, this, this, this again. There's, there's, there's a whole episode there, and I suppose tracking the, the kind of GW thing and and you know the, the exodus of those guys, whether it's the likes of you know you know Alessio and, and Paul Sawyer and things to, to Ronnie, um and more that set up you know the likes of Renendra Mantic. Um, I, f- I forget what what uh, what Alessio is called now. Oh, oh. River Horse. Thank you, River Horse. Yeah, I mean, you know, and he's doing board games. I mean, there's, there's a labyrinth board game. There's in the Dark Crystal board game. He's he's done all kinds of crazy. My stuff. Little Pony RPG. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was that? What was that cool chess one that he did as well? That was kind of um, uh, Locker or so Loki Loki, or Loki, Loki Loki or something. something yeah, yeah. yeah. They, you know, they, they've all they've all done a you know a huge variety of stuff, and it's almost I suppose like kind of irregulars been for for us guys and 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 be this in this kind of creative environment for us to spool out a product and a project that's then kind of you know everyone's gone their own way and done more it was very much like that with the gw crowd yeah i mean for us i think the biggest help is be is is been having the internet yeah. yeah because when i you could there were fanzines when i was growing up and were printed on someone's low grade printer and then stapled together and then handed out you know mm. they probably print maybe a hundred copies and they get handed out to friends family and, but with the advent of the internet you could suddenly get to a bigger audience even with just a blog yeah definitely and, that's, and, and, that, I, think, you and know, I think that's helped push the industry and the gaming oh it community. has I mean all, all I have to do is, is, is you know is, is look in my hand and my you know I've, I've, got, a, I've got an iPhone and just looking back, you know, of, of, I mean, I'm really fortunate to to have to have been been born when I've been born, you know, in the sense of, you know, having you know one of the first Windows 95 PCs at school to, you know, understanding the likes of you know Snake and you know you know your Nokia 3210 to the first colour phone you had to being on the internet and things and and really being able to kind of, I suppose, go on that journey with technology. As it's gone forward and, and kind of learned how to incorporate it, and you know we've we've rightly so taken advantage of it um, over time with the likes of Facebook groups, the magazine, and even obviously now to a certain extent with the with, with the podcast and the fact that you know podcasting seems to be on a bit of a boom uh, at the moment. You know, people, certainly for myself, I do a lot of travelling in the car um, to various client locations. And you know, as great as Radio Four can be sometimes, flicking on a podcast about the likes of you know um, Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, from from stuff I listen to on YouTube for my own personal personal choice and things, it's really rewarding to be able to to kind of listen to this sort of stuff. Um, and again, it, it it makes it so much easier having a PC, you know, on a phone, in, in, in for like a better term. And with it comes all the you know. The Kickstarter apps on there, the you know the fact you can order through through eBay on your phone. You know, it's never been a greater time, I suppose, really, to to have access to all this technology and all the amazing kind of products and things and companies that we have now. It's you know, I, I think Warren often puts it best when Beast of the Boy. You know, we're, we're in a golden age, yeah, so to speak. Um, I mean, he's, he's probably right. I mean, it, it, there's been no period prior to this where it has been. We've had it so good as a no, gamer. No, exactly. The, I mean, the choice is um, is just unbelievable. I mean, you can go into Patriot Games in town, and he's got board games, card games, miniature games. But that is even what he stocks isn't even 
probably a tenth of what's out there. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, if you put that point in there because you know they, they, there's so much that no one store can physically keep it keep it all in stock no. now. I mean, and again, the the advent of the internet, you know, the again the, the Kickstarters, the eBay, the 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 reviews online, the the, the channels, the number of of um, ways that information can reach you about a particular product a game it's backstory the, the the universe it's in you know what what's cool what's new it's never been so good as far as being able to get that and the fact that you can literally you know i could log online at three in the morning and order myself you know an arab israeli war starter set for 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 flames of war um and you know and never in history has that been possible you know certainly from you know looking back to the likes of white dwarf you know way back in the day when you used to have ring the trolls at games workshop and, 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 and mail order trolls yeah exactly I mean, exactly that was I mean, back back when i was a, when i were a youngster mail order was quite an ingenious um, idea um but you had to sort of either phone it or you had to mail your order off with your check or whatever. And it, you and you were sat there waiting for two, three weeks before you got it. Freaking hell, checks, gosh, yeah. I mean, when's the, when's the time you used a check? <laughs> Jeez. Uh, I've still got a checkbook, but um, no, it's, it's just like PayPal, PayPal, PayPal. But even, yeah. even that, you know, even PayPal as a facility, you know, has, has just changed the world and allowed so many small companies that, that were check based. To come to the twenty first century, yeah, it, technology um, has has done a lot for the industry. I, I think personally, uh, it's um, reaching. It's allowed small companies to reach wide audiences very, yeah. very easily. Yeah, and, and I think that is why we are seeing a, one of the reasons why we're seeing a boom in in the gaming industry, mm. um, and it's getting towards where it's becoming mainstream, like video games did. Yes, yeah, you know, the I mean, video games had a bit of a um, what was it early nineties with lots of games master and things, wasn't it on TV? Yeah, and it, uh, was the, it was the big thing of. I think it, it, what, there was a point where it was still it was considered a kids thing. Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden it went mainstream. Well, it's, it's this multi-million pound, billion, billion, bigger billion, than, bigger, billion, bigger, billion sorry, multi-billion now. pound, bigger than you know I think, most Hollywood blockbusters think, and studios. Yeah, I think last year the gaming, the electronic gaming industry, made more money than than Hollywood. Well, I'm I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised um, that at all. So, we I think we're about to see tabletop gaming go the next step, yeah, yeah, into mainstream because it's slowly becoming mainstream. People, there are newspapers talking about gaming in well, articles, exactly, stuff, yeah, on a, on a far more regular basis than they used to. No, and it's not just the financial results that, no. that they're focusing on, which I know um, those in the UK will have probably spotted. I think it was it was in the Times or something or the Week um, or the Guardian, maybe. That, that Games Workshop uh, as a as a company and its success story with the miniatures game it had done rather than its financial results yeah. was the point of the article and that, that tells you a lot that well, a major I, a major newspaper the thing is the con- the, what the concept that the, in the last few years that have come about is the war game cafe yes yeah oh, and yeah, I exactly. think that the fact that that has happened and it's not become this sort of like flash in the pan fad yeah, which is yeah. what everyone really when it was when the first con the concept was first devised and the first ones that did it announced they were doing it. And I think a lot of people just looked down and went, yeah, okay, six months and you'll uh, or, or, or you, you'll be closing down. Or even the concept of it being like, oh yeah, well you know it's it's full of like you know sm- smelly gamers and things in there in this dark little dungeon, and they are far far from it. No, I mean you know, far from it. We 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 we're, 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 we're fortunate in in Sheffield to have a number of, of, of um, gaming cafes and stuff and there's one I'm thinking of the treehouse that is really on the the cutting edge of you know it's, it's got you know local beers uh, and, and food yeah and, and I would say the majority of its clientele are not hardcore gamers no 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 I young professional and I, students yes, you know, and that, what that I mean by of, hardcore gamer the like people like us that have got a room full of junk <laughs> It's not junk. <laughs> my, my, my treasure. What are you talking about? Oh, 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 yeah. well, my, you my, know, my they're, plastic. They're, they're not people that. No, exactly. Yeah. Use, is that is their hobby? Yeah, yeah. And they probably have now. They're going on a regular basis to the cafe. Are probably buying 
games, well, it's, it's, and they're it's, having it on the shelf. But they're not. They well, I wouldn't have said they were hard, what I would call people that regularly buy games. No, and I, yeah. and I think you've, you again you, you've touched on a really good point there. With it's it's the likes of um, you know Cards Against Humanity, kind of apples to apples, you know Catan. Those those pandemic those, pan, 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 pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's a, that's I a mean, phenomenal I know game. people have got a pandemic that wouldn't call themselves a gamer. Yeah, yeah. But they've played that. They've gone through. I've met friends at a, at a um, gaming cafe. Mm. They've played pandemics on the games they've played, and they've gone and bought it. Yeah, exactly. And you know, all all, the, all these things combined, you know, with with, with the internet, with the lots of geeks and geek and sundry, to you know, critical role, to the fact that we have all these gaming cafes, um, you know, independent stockists. It's 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 never been better, you know. And and again, you know, going back to the very start of it for me for that for that kind of first forty k box set. You know, Games Workshop are still here, still producing, you know, amazing, amazing miniatures and, and fantastic games, and they can't they can't seem to produce stuff fast enough for us nowadays. Really, it's no. It's... And my 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 time at G my with GW goes back even. I still have well, the white I still have the white box upstairs. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, def, definitely, definitely. There's, there's there's a lot of we've got a, a ton of stuff which we can again go go for on on, uh, on multiple shows, but but hopefully. Um, you know, I, I think from 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 where we are with the show, you guys have enjoyed. I suppose a little bit of a trip down memory lane uh, for 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 Jason and myself. Um, and yeah, I, I suppose really what watch this space for uh, for other conversations, topic shows. We've got a whole bunch of of ideas for things. Um, so yeah, please please give us your thoughts and your uh, and your feedback. Uh, and I'll say yeah, thank you very much for for, for joining us on what hopefully is a is a very very long journey yeah and we'll see you next time yeah see you next time guys thank you very much